as Aldo said, I'll be talking about reverse genetics to facilitate the growth of FMDB for production of vaccines. And this is a joint project between ourselves at Purbright and Burraging Ingelheim. As we, I'm sure you all know, current FMDB vaccines are chemically inactivated virus preparations produced in large-scale mammalian cell culture, usually suspension BHK cells. And as we've, as we've heard, there's a periodic need to produce new vaccine strains against uh, various emerging field strains. Production of new vaccine strains involves adaptation of field viruses to cell culture in order to improve the growth characteristics of these viruses. Any measures that could improve the speed by which new vaccine strains can be adapted to cell culture could, be, uh, could have a large impact by increasing the amount of vaccine available, available globally for FMD control. When you adapt viruses, um, field viruses to cell culture, um, it's often associated with the acquisition of the ability to use alternative receptors not normally used by the uh, field viruses. So field strains use RGD-dependent alpha-V integrins, and alpha-V with a 6 is the most important of those. Um, tissue culture adaptive viruses can often use alternative receptors, including heparin sulfate and non-heparin sulfate receptors. Changes associated with the ability to use these, to use these non-integrin receptors often involves the acquisition of positively charged residues at various points in the capsid, for example, uh, the heparin sulfate binding site identified for type O or the five-fold symmetry axis, as uh, Francois-Marie was talking about yesterday. The aim of this work is to introduce previously described cell culture adaptation mutations by design using reverse genetics and assess if this leads to immediate and improved growth in cell culture. So the first stage in this work was to create chimeric infectious clones by capsid switching. So we start off with our infectious clone based on tissue culture adapted type O FNDV. This is a plasmid containing a cDNA copy of the genome. And then we swap uh, VP2, VP3, VP1 and 2A from a field strain into the capsid, into the clone, to produce a chimeric infectious clone with the capsid proteins and 2A from field strain and a backbone based on tissue culture adapted type O. As I've said, the first stage is to make these chimeric infectious copies carrying wild-type capsids, and we, we made one example each of the four most prevalent serotypes of FMDV, A, Asia, O, and SAT2. Second stage was to introduce targeted mutations into the wild-type capsid coding region in order to enable the chimeric viruses to grow better in cell culture when rescued, or hopefully so. <laughs> We looked at two categories of mutation. Firstly, um, the, around the heparin sulfate binding site, um, first identified for type o, O's. And here's an example of changes introduced for type A, with the blue residues, those present in the wild type, and the red residues, those changed to form the HS variant. We also looked at um, introducing changes in the five-fold symmetry axis, and um, these were for, for the type A shown here, this was based on changes we saw previously by passage of a type A virus. And for A, we produced a KK and RK variant of VP1109110, which is around the five-fold axis. Once you have all these plasmids, they're linearized, synthetic RNA is made, transfected into BHK cells, and then the supernatant was passaged to recover the viruses. And we recovered the wild-type capsids on primary bovine thyroid cells, and the mutant capsids on BHK cells. This table just shows a list of all the um, plasmids we, we made and whether they could be recovered or not with a tick or a cross. And basically, we could recover most but not all the variants. For example, for the type A's, we could recover all by the HS variant. For the Asia's, all by the RK, all the O's, and SAT is a bit more tricky. We only recovered wild type and one of the five-fold axis mutants. Once the viruses were produced, they were sequenced um, using an Illumina MySeq protocol. For the wild-type viruses, there was no capsid protein amino acid changes, and they should still have a wild-type phenotype for comparison. In a minority of the adaptive viruses, there were um, usually one or extra, yeah, one extra positively charged residues could sometimes be seen at the consensus level, and this would indicate uh, some extra pro um, adaptation during the recovery process. The first thing we did was to um, just some very simple experiments to look at the phenotype of the recovered viruses uh, in terms of which cell lines they could infect. So BTY cells, which are primary bovine thyroid cells, have heparin sulfate and also alpha-V with a 6 integrin, which is the most important integrin receptor used by field viruses. 
consistent with this, all our viruses, whether wild type or adapted mutations, could um, cause CP in these cells. We next looked at CHOK1 cells, and these have heparin sulfate, but they lack any of the integrins used by field viruses. And consistent with this, the wild type captive viruses um, didn't cause CP, whereas the mutants did, indicating they, have used, they are adapted to use non-integrin receptor. Lastly, we looked in BHK cells, which have heparin sulfate, and according to some reports, uh, alpha-VB3 integrin, which is used by uh, some field viruses, but not as efficiently as alpha-VB6. And it was a mixed bag for the wild-type captives. It might not be very apparent on there, but the A and the Asia showed some CP, whereas the O and the SAT didn't. But all the mutant viruses did show CP, indicating uh, better growth on BHK cells. To put some numbers on this, we just um, titrated these viruses on uh, BHK cells in blue or BTY cells in green for comparison. The A in the Asia, um, there was mutated viruses have a slightly higher by BHK type than the wild type, but more strikingly for the O and the SATs, these really don't grow very well at all uh, for the wild type capsids, so therefore when you introduce the um, changes you have a great enhancement of titer, whereas the BTY whereas the BTY titer is not much different between the wild type and the mutants. When you're introducing these sort of changes, um, one thing that uh, is a, um, you need to look at is whether this um, causes any great antigenic changes to the virus. So we did this by doing some v VNTs on BTY cells using ex existing cattle sera generated using viruses closely related to our strains. And we couldn't use BHK or Iris 2 since um, the O and the wild type or the SAT wild type really don't grow in these cells. So this is just an example of some data for the type A's where I've uh, incubated various concentrations of sera with the antibodies and then plated out onto BTY cells and read out the protection in terms of the, whether or not you get CPE. So for the antibody titer here is the dilution of antibody which gives 50% protection. And the R1 value is the ratio of antibody titer for mutant divided by that for wild type, as we've defined it here. This graph just shows a summary of all the data from the VNTs for all the viruses. For the A's and the, wild, and the Asia's, there is no real, uh, there's no noticeable difference between the, the neutralization titers between the mutants and the wild type, a captive carrying viruses. And I should say that the, um, blue, the blue bars are log neutralization titer and the R1 value is in red above. For the O's, there was a, a slight reduction in the neutralization titer, but the R1 value will remain well above the 0.3 um, cutoff. However, for the SATs, um, we did see quite a re reduction in the neutralization titer, and the R1 value is around 0.15. And we would require f uh, that would require further experiments to see whether that will be a problem in practice. But for the majority, vast majority of the viruses, there is little difference in uh, not a huge difference in the VNT titers, and therefore um, you would suspect not a great difference in antigenicity. In order to look at the relative rates of growth of these viruses, we um, did some uh, CPE ass um, assays looking at the rate of CPE of the various viruses um, in adherent BHK cells. And along the uh, y -axis, sorry, the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the percentage cell coverage in the well and as CP develops um, the curves go down so the quicker the curve goes down the, the quicker the CP. I should note that for the type O and the SAT we couldn't compare directly oh how do I go backwards it doesn't oh, it doesn't really matter it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, anyway um, as I was saying for the uh, type for the type A viruses the mutants show much quicker development of CP than the wild type. Similarly for Asia, the, a, the wild type is slowest, KK is faster, and HS faster still. As I said, for the type O's, we couldn't compare directly with the wild type because it grows that poorly in um, BHK cells that, that you can't even get a low MOI infection. However, the KK and RK um, viruses um, grew faster than the HS variant. The take-home message from this is that for all the serotypes tested, the mutant viruses show faster growth than the wild type, in terms of CP development at least. Um, that previous slide was done with adherent BHKs, but as I'm sure you're aware, um, vaccine virus production is done with suspension BHKs. So our colleagues at Boehringer Ingelheim 
did some work to look at the uh, CP development over time of the various viruses in the suspension BHKs. I don't, I don't want to go through these in immense detail except to say that in each case the uh, mutant viruses showed faster development of CP than did the wild type. <laughs> Lastly, we looked at whether the introduced capsid changes could enhance 146S yield in suspension BHKs or not. And uh, this was, again was done at, at BI in Lelystadt. And for the type O's, well, the wild type doesn't grow at all, therefore the, or not to any great extent in these cells, therefore the introduced mutations give a great in, in a large um, increase in one plus excess yield. The KK and the RK in this case gave higher yields compared to the heparin sulfate. Unfortunately, for the type A's, there was no significant difference between the wild type and the mutants in terms of yield. For the Asians, again, um, the, wild, the mutants didn't show a higher yield than the wild type, but the KK was higher than the HS. More happily, for the SAT2, again, the yield of the mutant was higher than the wild type since the wild type really doesn't grow at all. So to summarise, the introduced capsid changes greatly enhanced the 146S yield in the wild type for the SAT and the type O viruses, i.e. those which grow very poorly, very, very poorly to start with, but not for the A and the Asia. To summarise, we were able to rescue viruses carrying capsid proteins from type A, Asia, O and SAT2 field strains in a type O backbone. The viruses carrying mutations in the heparin sulfate binding site or the fivefold axis, which are designed to enhance growth in, five, in, enhance growth in BHK cells, were also rescued and gained the ability to infect CHO cells indicative of alternative receptor usage. Mutants, the mutants with the exception of SAT2 KKR showed response comparable to wild type in neutralization assays in B2Y cells, indicating that they don't have a greatly um, different antigenicity. In terms of speed of growth by CP, the mutants were faster um, than the wild type in all cases in adherent and suspension BHKs. And when we looked at 146S yields, the SAT2 and the type O mutants, i.e. those where um, wild type equivalents grow extremely poorly in BHK cells to begin with, they showed enhanced 146S yield over wild type and suspension BHKs. These recombinant techniques could have proved highly valuable to speed up the new vaccine strain development by reducing the need for time consuming tissue culture adaptation and increasing the, need, the success rate of growing field strains in tissue culture. I'd just like to acknowledge um, all those the, involved in the project at Purbright and at Boehringer Ingelheim. <coughs> 